questions since he's the next speaker. And I think Eric, you would have to uh, share your slides, right? Yeah, let me see if I can. Um, Great. So your sound is this word. I, I'm a little worried about this thing is the sharing. Oh, wait, allow, okay. Open. What's going on? Zoom. Oh, uh, no. Zoom updated sometime recently. So hold on. Oh. So let me, this could be a problem. Might have oh, to. Oh, no. So you mean it's modern software? Sorry. I yeah. Okay. I used Zoom relatively recently, but maybe it updated somewhere, caused problems. Uh, okay, so I just updated it. Okay, so I did that and then that. Okay, later. So now the question is, will this, I might have to, okay, maybe this will work. There's a chance this will work. Uh, is that showing, I hope? That's the background. So it's not yet the presentation view, but it is, uh, it is a view. You, you see my name and a title slide? Yes, but not the presentation view. So you still have yeah, to present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have it in the power. OK. I, I, looks, can't, I can't see good. what you see right now. So this is a problem. Yeah. OK. It looks very much like, suspiciously like what you would show. How about that? Yeah. Does that look better? Uh, not yet. Not, not yet. Bad. I think you might have to switch displays. Oh, this wait. I'm in the wrong share. Hold on. OK, hold on. I think I have to change my screen to the right. Mm -hmm. So it switches screens, yeah. but I have three monitors. So if I do here, and yeah. if I do share, maybe if I do desktop, okay, desktop two. Mm -hmm. There, how about that? Does that look better? Perfect. It does look better, okay. Okay. Thank you, go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure how this, okay, so I'm hoping this works. Uh, yeah, so my name is Eric Velasca. Uh, today, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, NWCHEM EX AMD development. Uh, it's something that right now I'm just calling PWDFT. Uh, NWCHEM EX, I think Bert talked about it the other day. It's kind of a lot of different different parts and pieces and, and sort of being developed in tandem. And so this is a little bit of an update and just sort of a, a little brief history or, or stuff that's going on. Okay, so now the hope, okay. So many of you probably aren't aware is that way back when, but the times when, uh, and by the way, I'm really happy to see lots of young developers in this uh, symposium. Uh, it's, it's been sort of a long dry, dry spell of this. And it's nice to see that we're starting to see more of this uh, in the US and, and around the world. But uh, so this is sort of going back to my obsession with time. Uh, so as many of you probably don't know, I was originally hired uh, in, in DOE, into DOE lab at PNNL into a geochemistry group, right? So I wasn't hired into some esoteric group and it was sort of a core mission group. And, and if you work in the DOE labs, you begin to realize that they have, they tend to have certain missions that they tend to focus on more or less. I mean, it's flexible, but that, that's always there. And, and clearly in geochemistry, well, you know, containment is a big issue, right? So, especially for heavy elements, because, you know, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna remediate uh, uranium, plutonium or whatever type of species. You're, the only thing you can do is contain and hopefully it doesn't transport into where you don't care, right? So that, that's, a big, that's a big issue. And several of my colleagues have, you know, obviously worked on this over the years, uh, very good people, you know, from, you know, again, you wouldn't know these people, but John Zakra and Andy Felmy are sort of the originators of the, one of the early people in the group that I was in. And, and today, Rosso, Kevin, Kevin Rosso, Eugene Elton, and many others. So anyway, so I bring this up. So uh, Eugene Elton, a few years back, came up with this kind of cool, uh, co-precipitation chemistry of the uh, heavy elements, specifically uranium. He's, he's very interested in uranium speciation. Uh, and he saw that, you know, he could definitely put this in iron oxides and contain it, look pretty, pretty good. And of course, the reviewer, I don't mention this guy from Oak Ridge, you probably don't know him, and I think he's retired now, but nice guy. 
he made the snarky remark is like, well, that's all well and good, but that's never going to exist in the environment. It doesn't exist in the environment. And so, so Eugene sort of, it's stuck in his craw and being a very good geologist, geochemist, he, you know, found, he went to the source. So he went to this, uh, some colleagues in Australia where they have this very famous deposit. It's called the Olympic Dam ore deposit in Australia. You may, you may have read about this in the news over the last whatever, whatever uh, decade plus, but it's, it's an important deposit. And uh, it's because it's really old, right? There's also stuff up in Montreal, but this is one in Australia that's very old. Well, in this deposit, they found uranium, which of course excited Eugene that he actually had a natural mineral with, with this kind of uranium. And then he did the analysis and he found this pentavalent oxidation state. And basically pentavalent was U5. Generally, this isn't thought to be stable, but here it was in this uh, ore deposit, it was stable. And, and that's uh, pretty remarkable given that this ore deposit is 1.6, you know, if you don't know what GA mean, that means 1.6 billion years old, right? This is old stuff, right? And part of how he did this were really critical component to figuring out the speciation and the structure and the solid is that he, you know, relied on AIMD or ab initial molecular dynamics modeling to, to basically characterize or, or, or map out the, the X-ray measurements that they do, you know, the XFs and the, and the Zanes measurements. And so in some sense, what we do, you know, it's, can have this really like grandiose impact, right, over long times and just, for fun, I put this uh, little diagram together, like how, how old is, how long goes 1.6 billion years, right? So here's a little picture. I, I'm sorry if you, you know, are offended from the Jesus things, which are, which is way over to the, to the right. But, you know, the solar system's about four and a half, maybe 4.6 billion years old, right? It's, it's pretty old. Um, and of course, you know, from this perspective of uranium, oh, well, we're about halfway, you know, if we think about, well, that's fine. It's pretty old. Like how long is the earth going to live for? Like how long is it going to be around? And generally it's thought that we're about halfway there. And uh, which is kind of important from the point of view that if you're worried about uranium containment, right? And you've got something in a ore deposit that's 1.6 or 1 billion years old, generally you're probably not going to have to worry about it. Right, if you're if you can do the right kind of geoengineering, right? I guess that's that's the hope, or actually it suggests that that's probably true. Of course, I, this is a throwback to my college days. That you know, when is the end of the Earth? Well, it's actually just a few miles away from an engineering school that I went to up in northern Michigan. If you don't know the site, I think this is on 26, but it might have been 41 U.S. or I don't know. It's so long ago, but uh, it's kind of a joke. But more to the point is. You know, it's not really 4.5, it's really only a billion years. So generally we've had uranium in these ore deposits with a U5 species in it for over a billion years, which is longer than we're gonna be around. The oceans are gonna boil away long, be, you know, within a billion years. So keeping back to my kind of ideas of time or, or emphasis on time, when you do AMD simulations, which is, uh, sort of one of the things that really what I tend to focus on, right? Strong scaling is the key. It's not Gustafsson's law. It's really the hard on dolls law types of questions that you end up doing and you tend to optimize your codes and your thinking and your whatever skill sets to do that. And, and so why is this important? Well, if you're doing something like AMD, this is true for MD as well, right? It's a, it's a big problem for molecular dynamics, just on a different time scale. Right, going beyond microseconds is really difficult. In dynamics. But uh, but if you're doing some simulation, like 20 picosecond simulation time, so let's, let's say a couple hundred thousand steps, right? Well, if you're doing each step in a second per step, that's two to three days of simulation. You do it in 13 seconds, well, that's 70 days, right? It changes quickly. And of course, as you get to you know, lot longer time scales, this gets worse, right? So if you go to a nanosecond, this could be 100 to 200, I will 100 to 150 days of simulation time. So 
basically a, a requirement or, or a really important aspect of AIMD is to reduce this time step as much as possible. And generally a target that I typically go for, and I'd like to be faster and I can, you know, obviously you can for smaller systems is, but I generally try to target about one second per step. Okay, so I'm going to go back sort of similar to what the previous talk talked about. Um, I'm not sure why this is, anyway, it's supposed to be chicken movies. So, maybe um, that basically, in, uh, now again, this is, the, I'm talking about plane wave methods. I guess I haven't brought that up yet, but generally there are three major hotspots in, in this type of code. And one is, of course, applying the, the, you know, the Coulomb and exchange correlation. You can add exchange to that as well. Um, although exchange, it becomes, an, you know, N squared FFTs. Uh, Non-local city potentials and sort of some type of enforcing of orthogonality. And, uh, these are basically your hotspots. So, so it's basically the evaluation of all these FFTs, right? which gets you to the density that allows you to evaluate these operators. And then of course, the things of non-local pseudo potentials and orthogonality. These are your basic hot stops. Okay, I'm trying to make it too quickly. So the distribution we tend to, you tend to use in a, in a code is you, uh, you basically distribute the grid into, you know, parallelize it across orbitals and grid points. And if you're doing K points, then you would optimize across K points, although K points is a little bit. Uh, yes, you can do it and it scales really well, but often if you do very big system sizes, you often don't need a ton of K points. So it's kind of self defeating. In a way. So you, you, know, you tend to use large K points for fairly small systems. So you can paralyze, but it's often not a, a critical problem, especially with things like AMD. But that's just the layout of the grid. So you can think of the column, you know, along the right down would be sort of the size of the FFT grid. And then you can think of this as the number of orbitals in the system. And if you wanted to add K points, you can look at a orthogonal direction map. Okay. So the first bottleneck is really something to call 3D FFTs. And clearly, you know, in the early 90s, as, as uh, Professor Chalikowski was talking about, there was a lot of go a lot of desire to avoid FFTs, right? And for parallelization reasons, and for a very good reason. And I think the previous talk showed some of the advantages of potentially dumping FFTs. But that being said, I, I have tended to work on FFTs for quite a while. And I just wanted to show you basically a layout of what these FFTs kind of do. You start with a cube, a, a grid, a 3D cube. You often only store certain values in that grid, like a little sphere or hemisphere uh, in your, in your grid, so this is significantly smaller than the grid. And then you do these FFTs where you basically do an FFT in one dimension, do some type of rotation, then you get this slightly bigger, you do an FFT in another dimension, and so on and so on until you get this final result where it's all filled in. And the really nice thing with the parallelization and the strategy is that while you're not this gray zone when you're doing these rotations are zeros. And so these are things you don't have to pass, right? And so this is an algorithm that was done, I wish I could remember the original person who did this, but certainly Andrew Cannon was part of that uh, and others. So I think this more or less came out of Stephen Louis' group, these kinds of concepts. But this has been around for a while. But I brought this up partly because I wanted to point out that we're not paralyzing the 1D FFT here, right? That we've gone to great lengths with parallel, we get good scalability or parallelization, but we're doing these 1D parallel 1D FFTs basically with some standard package in serial. So we haven't really parallelized. Okay, you can take this another step. You know, you can get into sort of actor-based models or, or uh, data flow models or, or whatever you want to call this. And there's, there's a lot of work on that. And um, there's even some automated compilers and, and pretty cool stuff that people have used to do this. And uh, um, you know, the point of the matter is that, yeah, you often, you know, by those kinds of work, you're often inspired to do algorithms to help you overlap computation communication. I sort of did similar things to do pipelining FFTs that the different stages you can pipeline. You could do multiple FFTs together. And so, you know, this is kind of all this balance. 
you know, obviously we get into things like exchange where we're going to have n squared FFTs because we're essentially solving n squared Coulomb type problems, right? This is even more advantageous, right? So, you know, it's it's a strategy that one can do to overlap communication, computation, and reduce latency, right? The effects of latency. And so this is all on my own. I wanted to point out there's also sort of these Lagrange multipliers, also conceptually non-local projectors, although the projectors are easier, which I'll explain briefly. But there's basically three kinds of multiplications that one worries about. They're basically tall skinny, right? So a reduction, tall skinny, tall skinny to a small square. You know, then you have sort of the three squares, which is basically standard dense matrix multiply. And then you have this rotation, right? Tall skinny. And so I label these as sort of the tall skinny as F and M as sort of the regular dense matrix. And so I have what I call FFM, MMM, and FMM. And I should also point out that non-local projectors conceptually have the same kind of design or, or layout. The difference is that one of these rows here or one of these tall skinny is sort of static. And so there's certainly efficiencies that you can do. And, and as a result, generally non-local projectors scale uh, really quickly. Okay. So I don't know, a few years ago we worked on, we were porting this to, I guess the KNL, this became a really high priority. Uh, and I show this because a lot of people say, well, just use MKL, just be done with it, right? Or some package from the vendor. And the first thing, you know, realized, and I said, well, I was old enough, to, I was experienced enough to know that there'd probably be issues. But what you'll see, even when you run MKL, and this is the most optimistic thing, right? And we were actually in the, the bowels of Intel testing this with the Intel engineers. You see this kind of concept of what I would call dark silicon, not very good performance, right? This And this is DGEMS, right? And it's basically, you have to go to pretty large orbital sizes before you can do it. And that's fine. But, you know, if you're trying to run a second first step, you know, and then you're combining with different data layouts and all that, you know, we're not generally looking to run at 30 seconds per step. We're trying to run a second first step that we're tending to be more in the dark silicon region. So this sort of inspired, you know, not inspired, but basically it was a drive to push. And I, and I knew this that we would write our own shared memory programming, or if you like open MP programming. And so this is just sort of a layout. Essentially you're writing your own parallel programming that's doing kind of what MKL does. And, and for some things, the, you know, the standard DGEM operations, you can basically straightforwardly put in open MP commands conceptually and get pretty good parallelization. And for, I think something like FFM that works reasonably well, you can, you can, you can, uh, do some optimizations, but definitely for FMF, I think it was, it was the order that you had to be much more careful and how you design the algorithm. Okay, so here I'm going back to uh, Intel, whatever, the KNL, uh, this, this does have a purpose as I will get to. Um, basically, this is just showing you internode performance. This was at the time the Haswell versus the KNL. And you can see, you know, we could, you could get performances through this thing, to this KNL. It took some work. We had to rewrite code, right? We couldn't just use MKL to do this, but but we we, we were able to do it, and um, so that that's good. Um, and then you know you could look at this in parallel, and then we run Haswell. And remember, this is cores, so this would be, I guess, eight thousand cores, whatever, on the Haswell, and then. However, however nodes that is. And then, you know, we could take that a little bit further, you know, we could take it bigger and we would run on the KNL. Um, you know, you see this, it works pretty well up to 70 grand, right? And this isn't even exchange, right? This is just regular straightforward, you know, low level DFT. And, and the I mean, I'm not bringing exchange, but I do exchange on, the, you know, Forget it, right? Because it's well over 100,000, right? That was demonstrated some years ago, but uh, much more expensive calculation. So we do that, and then I don't know, maybe this is not moving. Yeah, we took this another step, and of course, you could do processor grid stuff. You can take this stuff. This is a very common trend that as you use up one parallelization, you can switch on another, and then you can sort of take it even further. And so this just shows you that you get. 
uh, pretty good performance on there. And so this is all well and good. We work really well on a KML, got, even for AMD, and even for in the le least optimistic thing, I didn't take the most expensive variant. I took the more bread and butter variant of what you'd want to do. And it worked pretty well. We've got good scalability, good, pretty good performance. But of course, as you know, things change quickly, right? So just a couple of years ago, I think Argon was like, well, oh, KNL or whatever, the next variant of that is going to be their machines. And then of course they had this big to do, which you see coming, but they said, oh no, it's all going to be GPUs. And Intel is going to be doing GPUs. And so everything gets delayed. And so there's definitely been a switch, uh, a reorganization towards GPU development. And here it's kind of a, yeah, I wanted to just show, you know, you can switch between, yeah, with the NWCM EX development, C++, you can switch all these things, these operations, these kernels, basically a simple make file. I mean, a simple include files and you can switch between different models. You could, you could, you know, put a little language wrapper around that if you wanted to, but the point is it's pretty easy to, to move, but uh, you use these standard libraries and definitely I'm focused on the Intel. And, you know, when we looked at the, a uh, single GPU, and again, this is a uh, whatever on, on chip type of integrated GPU, not not the best, right? We could get pretty good performance, but uh, when we anyway, but I'll, I'll show more to the bad news. But we, we're definitely still having problems with FFTs. Here's sort of the similar plots of the dark silicon. Here it's maybe only blue rather than black, right? And so it's better, right? But there is a limit, right? And so you have to worry about these kinds of questions and, and, and how you deal with it. But generally, this these kinds of FFM and FF, FMF types of operations really aren't the first bottleneck. The real bottleneck, and here I show some got is the MPL, is the FFTs, right? This shouldn't come as any great surprise. This is well, this is again the Intel FFTs. And uh, or the Intel GPU FFTs and their sickle, um, whatever they call it, whatever they call that library, when it's the FFTs. But the uh, point is, is that this is known, right? Even if you if you do in parallelization of a 1D FFT, this is hard. And yes, there are libraries out there. There are even libraries back in the, you know, even algorithms from back in the 80s of how to parallelize 1D FFTs, right? And, and some well-known books. But uh, the point is, um, you know, these algorithms, you know, we often make these things sound magical. You know, an FFT algorithm, okay, this is a base two, but this is it. This is a whole FFT, right? This will do everything. So you can see the level of code is relatively simple, right? But you got to make this work on a device. You got to parallelize this, right? And generally with GPU, you have problems, right? So the problems with GPU programming are, are in some sense the opposite of shared memory, right? So the models can be pretty fast. So yes, you got to move data there and all that. Uh, that's generally a true uh, uh, parallel programming. That's a big problem. But when you get into things like FFTs, well, yeah, I, I just put this out. So NVIDIA is okay. Right? It's, it's better. And certainly even when I used it 10 years ago, 12, or whatever it was with Ralph Farber, it was pretty good. Uh, but yeah, so the the Intel's weren't good, and you know worked pretty a lot with extensively with the Intel engineers, and to sort of resolve this. And you know, it's the typical thing with vendors. Well, it'll be better. We'll have a better version in you know three months, or I guess they always say three months rather than six months. I guess if you're academics, you say six months. If you're industry, maybe you say three. But uh, the key thing here is that um, yeah, the key aspects of a paralyzing this model, at least on a GPU, is you're going to have to unroll. This is a big thing with GPUs, as far as I can tell. You've got to unroll things into different steps, different stages. Um, you also got to point out that with the kind of FFTs we're likely to use, you're going to be in this range where maybe N squared algorithms might win out over N, N log N style algorithms. And so you got to play those balances. You also, got to deal, you also have to Think about to gain performance multiple FFTs at the same time, pipelining from MPI, et cetera. You should point out that there's a project by Phil Colella, and if you don't know him, he's sort of a long term DOE Oscar guy, he's a professor at Berkeley for years. I think he's semi retired, but he's still leading this project. He's leading this ECP project on FFTs. And so he's 
that, that group, they're really working on all this and, and building in, you know, a good GPU uh, FFT library so that they could be used by a variety of software and including electronic structure is certainly one of their targets. I just sort of want to end with this kind of, you know, writing MPI, you know, I think, you know, as developers, we need to remember that relying on vendors is problematic, right? We, yes, I'm not saying don't use vendors, or, but you need to collaborate. And don't pretend that somehow that they have HP experts when you're probably the expert or more likely to be the experts. And so that's important that you need to collaborate. And then also you can't just hand it off to somebody else. Say, well, somebody else will do this. No, this is your job. And I would also point out that if you're older, with younger developers, you got to be really patient with junior staff. So that you got to encourage them and get them to do because it can be a hard slog to to work on some of these algorithms. Okay, so I want to finalize my. How much time do I have? I might have a couple minutes. Yeah, maybe one or two minutes. Not not uh, very many, but you can. Okay, so I wanted to sort of end my talk with something that's related to the PWDFT and using PWDFT. It's basically extending these technologies to, to high level methods. And so many of you may not may know or may not know that you, it's fairly easy to write a second quantized Hamiltonian, even for a plane wave method, and I wrote it here. And so the key thing is that you have to have these orbitals, right, that come from somewhere. You know? So typically you keep that size fairly small. Now in plane wave codes, often this has been done by using you know, some type of Hartree Fox, or not plane wave code, but some type of, in most codes, it's typically some type of Hartree Fox solution that gives you these orbitals. Uh, plane wave codes, they often pick up to a certain energy level. Some people are more creative, like Eric Shirley uh, and probably Jim and, and others, where they, they figure out how to reduce that basis set size, where they try to, to fit a more optimal basis set to a bigger basis set. There, there's, there's stuff out there. Um, so, but generally it's energy scale. So I wanted to show this. So if you look at something like H2, pretty simple. If you look at a, oops, a plane wave code, right? And a heart, and a, a heart, you know, a triple zeta base cycle, you get pretty much the same answer. It looks pretty good, right? Now the, here's the catch. When you run the virtual orbitals with plane wave code, the big, you know, relatively big box. And yes, I'm using a periodic boundary condition. So you get the right, Coulomb, not really a critical thing for H2, but whatever, we'll discuss that in a bit. But what you'll see very quickly, if you look at the virtual orbitals from Planet Girls, that well, you'll have scattering states. You don't get your typical, what you expect, or what you're used to, I shouldn't say what you expect, but what you're used to in your LCL, your confined quotes, right? And uh, this is, this is so if you ran a really, really, really large Gaussian base set calculations, you're gonna get something like this. You're going to get these kinds of states as your as your basis up, and then if you look at your sort of two electron integrals and calculate that, what you'll see is well small in a lot of these over right in a lot of these ranges, and so what does that mean? It means when you go do the correlation, right? And this is sort of full CI with with twenty virtuals. Well, 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 you don't gain a lot of correlation, right? Hence the need for figuring out basis sets. Well. You can make things better by, you know, let's say, take a H1 virtual space. So you just take a single Hamiltonian. Well, this is these are bound states by definition. You can do it, and yes, you capture some correlation, right? Which is good, but not anywhere close to what you would want. Okay, so I don't know. About a year ago, whatever, developed this concept. It's it, uh, where we could define a virtual space, right? And we didn't define a virtual space by trying to fit to some one electron Hamiltonian results or band structure results. We said, no, we're going to take a different approach that we're going to optimize the virtuals such that we minimize a small CI Hamiltonian. All right. And then so from that, we can define our virtual orbitals. And so, and then so you could just take one virtual orbital, you could define a two by two or three by three or six by six, whatever you can take, whatever however you want to do it. But you can take the lowest orbital layer or whatever orbital you want, and you can optimize it for your virtual orbital, and then you get your one orbital, and then you can do that subsequently by orthogonalizing uh, along the chain. 
And the thing is that when you do this, so when you do the one virtual orbital, so here's the orange, it's pretty good, right? It's definitely better than here. And then when you start to go to like four, eight, 16, but you can see by four, it's starting to look like all the same, right? If you zero in on it, right? You see that it's really good and it's converging nicely, right? So that's a, that's a key thing. It's not random and all over the place. This is systematic. And so you're starting to see basis sets that look kind of akin to properties from a Gaussian basis set. I should point out that there's a number in here that's wrong. I keep, I never remember the changes. Basically this 3.39, the Gaussian triples A is actually the same kind of number. But uh, the point is this kind of works, it's pretty cool. And you say, well, I don't know. So people get a little you know, defensive about things they don't understand. But uh, you could take this to a different level, like beryllium two. It's a classic problem in, really in a playwright calculation, and it's dissociative. Yep. We we may have to come to a point where we wrap up. I think. Okay. So if, all right. I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So I'll finish. I'll finish right now. One more slide. So point is, you could do beryllium two, and, and this is all correlation, right? Find these all from correlation, not not from the bounds. We recently extended this to periodic systems. This is a more mathematics uh, describing brilliant zone integration and how, how you do this. Um, basically, I'm using concepts from King and Parr and this old paper, along with some recent work on phelon integration for exchange and, and two electron integrals. So I don't really have time to talk about that. And the point is that we can do this, you know, where we can do a periodic H2. Calculation. So this is just the Hart two pi. This is the one exchange. You see, it works pretty well. And this is just one orbital, right? And so we can do Markovos. We can do LIH. And so you can start to now really truly capture the correlation at the same level as uh, as your more traditional quantum chemistry. And with that, I think I'll I'll, I'll end. And thank you for your time and patience. And uh, also thanks to the variety of sponsors over the years. <laughs>